find out about new ideas and new technologies? Read. But reading books is one way to expose your brain to new ideas. Drop an idea, drop an idea, drop an idea. <coughs> one way to think about innovation is to think bigger than you are today. Right? Always think bigger. Uh, I'm a director at Amazon in Seattle, and uh, I've spent a lot of time in the tech industry, about 28 years total, uh, as well as a bunch of time at Amazon. I've done private consulting. I've done uh, 17 years at Microsoft. And so hopefully I have a pretty good view as to where some of the technology and trends are going. And hopefully uh, this can be a good open experience. Ask questions, should be interactive. So a little bit about me. So I did not start my technology uh, career in a tech area. I was an underwater welder, construction. I did uh, that for three years. My most favorite job, even above technology, was I was a treasure diver. So I looked for Spanish treasure off the coast of Florida. And so that was pretty cool. Uh, there was a wreck called the Atosha uh, that sank in the 1600s that uh, we spent a fair amount of time salvaging. Found gold, silver, emeralds. That was a, a great experience. So didn't really have that formal education in IT. Um, I've gone to school. Uh, most of that was around um, geography, geology, uh, marine engineering. And then over the last 17, 20 years, I've started to get more into the technology area. Uh, right now, I'm currently working on a cybersecurity degree as well, since that's an area and a theme that we'll talk about as I go through the slides. Uh, I have uh, two kids. Uh, my youngest is 11, and my oldest is 16. Uh, last year, and I'll pop forward, he came out with me here a year ago, and we went snowboarding, and he had a great experience. Uh, he really wanted to come back and visit again this year. He loves, he loves being here. I uh, like to travel and I like to cook. So if you don't find me in a technology space, likely I'm scuba diving or cooking and just having some fun with that. It's a good way to decompress and unwind from a day filled with meetings and switching between different uh, technologies that, that we have to inter interact with. Um, definitely like to go to exotic areas. Uh, warm areas are the best. You know, a beach is uh, always a nice thing, though I've done a lot of time down in uh, Africa as well. Uh, I took that photo there of a leopard, just perfect, perfect position to take a picture of a big cat sitting about six feet away from you. Uh, those are my two boys. We have a cabin uh, in eastern Washington, so we're in the northwestern part of the United States. Uh, a lot of snow there uh, on the other side of the mountains, and uh, just a great place to go and relax and have fun. So that's another area to, to decompress, and that will also come out in the slides as we go through that. So the point of my conversation today is to talk about how do you let yourself innovate, right? There's a maker lab here, uh, new ideas are flowing all the time, but are there things that you can do that help, right? Because a lot of us have great ideas, but sometimes they come up in the middle of the night. You wake up, that's a great idea. But how do you try and make that a normal process for what you do on a day-to-day -day basis? So how do you let that happen? Any ideas? How do people let themselves innovate to think of a new idea? Decompressing. Decompressing? Yep. To do something that lets your brain just take a break. Right? Because if you're in school, you got studies. If you have to work, you have your job. If you have a relationship, how do you balance that relationship with innovating new ideas? Maybe you can tie that together, right? But those kind of times kind of come out as, as like dating sites and you probably don't want to have a relationship with your partner about a new dating site. So, first off, at Amazon, and then a little bit about my role at Amazon. So, my team, I have a team that does a couple different things. First off, as Amazon buys new companies, companies that have been out innovating new ideas, we go out and say, that's a good one, or that's a good one, and we'll purchase them. So during that purchase, they have to figure out how to take this little company and stick it inside a much bigger company. Amazon has about 600,000 employees. So when we buy a company, we're adding on to that. So we have to figure out how to have you get an account. How do you get email? 
And we're dealing with companies who are very, very uh, innovative and nimble. They grew up in the cloud. They grew up lots of new ideas. When you take that great new idea and try to force it into a company that's as big as, as Amazon is, it takes a lot of work. Because a lot of times it doesn't flow easily. So my group goes in and tries to figure out how to get email. They might be using Gmail. So how do you get them on Amazon Mail? They might be doing everything in the cloud. But at Amazon, we have a huge, huge thing about security. We use the cloud, but not as much as people would think. Because Amazon is a trust company. Everyone familiar with Amazon as a company? Yeah. Okay. So Amazon is a trust company. When you come to buy something in Amazon, you want to trust that we're not going to sell your information. They can't come steal your credit card or debit card information. That you're not going to get solicited by some country in a, a third world who's trying to steal something from you, right? So we're all about trust. And to make sure that we have that trust built through all of our systems, we don't always put everything out in the cloud. We do a lot more kind of on-premise type of work. Now, we still use the cloud, and it's a major part of the business, but it's a balance of trying to figure out how to incorporate a small company that's in the cloud into a bigger company that's all about trust. Because the last thing you want is us to lose your credit card information. That would, that would just make us another retailing website. Right? But we're bigger than that. So it's a lot of work to be able to do that. The other part of my group is what's called uh, corporate infrastructure build out. So anywhere Amazon puts in a new building, and if you look up, you see these access points, AV systems, speakers. My team goes into any new Amazon building and fits it out. So if the company comes and builds the building, we put in networks, storage, compute, wireless, audiovisual. And so there's a fair amount of work because we're growing. We do about 125 new buildings a year. So there's a lot of work engaged in that team. Uh, budget is about 40 to 45 million US dollars. Now, so not huge, but that's just the infrastructure that we're putting into the facility. Uh, previous to that, I spent 17 years at Microsoft. In that, I worked at the games organization. So if you're familiar with Xbox, I had built the first Xbox Live environment, built the data centers that all that sits in, and then went off, <laughs> uh, then went into the IT organization on how to have a big IT infrastructure system support unique businesses. So the nature of IT is to have it very repeatable, have it well balanced, and cheap to support. So that's great, you have that balanced over here. But then you have an innovative group like the game studios, who they want to be able to use a different protocol. They want to have wireless networks which overwhelm the wireless systems within the building. How do you let a product group be innovate, innovate new ideas, yet at the same time find that balance between innovation and supportability? So eight years of my time at Microsoft was to build a team specifically around that. How do we look at the mobile phone group? How do we look at games? How do we look at the video groups? They all have different needs, yet you try to fit them into a standard box, and that doesn't always work. So we had to be creative about which box we had these groups stand up and work in. And so taking that knowledge, I went off and did three years of private consulting and then into Amazon to do corporate acquisitions. Uh, there's a company, right when I started at Amazon, there was a company that we acquired named Ring. Anybody heard of Ring, ring.com? They're a digital doorbell company. So basically you ring the doorbell, or, or you, you walk up, it senses you, turns on a camera, I get an alert on my phone, and I can see who's at my door from anywhere in the world. So Ring was acquired by Amazon to incorporate that technology into their alarm systems and home systems that they're building. So today, I can, I, my cabin, and, uh, you know, this uh, out here in the eastern Washington right here, I, right there, that view, I have a Ring camera set up. So if somebody comes in my backyard, send, I can sense it. My phone right over there, it'll send me an alert, and I can look and see who it is, right? So those are innovative ideas that our company is looking for to acquire. It just makes it super unique on how do you do that. So there's always something pushing the standard that you can never feel comfortable, right? So the whole time, one way to think about innovation is to think bigger than you are today, right? Always think bigger. 
There's not something small about the entire globe, the moon, and the sun. That's pretty big. But the intent there is to have that feeling that what you're looking at today can always be something bigger. If I'm going to have an automated car, can I have an automated airplane? Right. So what's the next thing? Because if all you think about is where you are today, you'll get replaced rather quickly. Right. Each of you in this room is thinking about some idea that's going to leapfrog some other idea. Right. Microsoft was a great example of this. Rarely does Microsoft be the first person. Right. They, they weren't the first person with an operating system. They weren't the first person with a network stack. But they took your good idea and your good idea and made it a better idea. And then once they made that better idea, they are fiercely competitive to keep that idea. It's like you know, Netscape. Netscape was a browser. You know, now Chrome. You know, Microsoft used to be really good at the uh, internet browser. They're not so good anymore because other companies are always pressing. So you have to think big. You have to be persistent. Ideas, they take a lot of time to nurture. Right? These ideas that you know, you're gonna come up with an idea and tomorrow somehow it's gonna make a million dollars, sure, that happens. It doesn't happen a lot. Those people who are, how many people have worked in a startup here before or seen a startup culture? Couple. You probably didn't just go in and work a couple hours and say, yeah, we did it, right? It's persistent. It's over and over again. You took that idea, you tried that idea, and you might have failed. Like, failure is a huge part of innovation. You innovate, you fail, you try it again. But to do that, you have to have a lot of persistence. You have to just keep trying and trying. And being persistent, leads to taking risks. Here, yeah, there's a, uh, there's a speaker called, uh, named Simon Sinek. He talks about uh, Apple and the release of the iPod, which is the music player that came out prior to the iPhone. Right? They weren't the first company to produce an MP3 player. Right? There were other devices out there to listen to music. They took some risks they thought there was a better way to present it and make it much cooler than it was. Right? So if you look at an Apple ad today, you rarely see something about the actual product. Like, it's a great phone, it has numbers and you can dial. It's the lifestyle, there's people dancing, they're having fun. They took an idea and made it better by taking a risk that the consumer would rather have a device that makes everyone around them cool and great versus sole ability just to listen to music. Right? So there's risks that you take. If you, um, how many here people heard of Tesla's, Tesla car, right? Tesla, and then his, uh, the other company is a company named SpaceX, which I'll talk a little bit about. They've taken risk after risk after risk, after failure after failure after failure. But they're sending rockets into space, and they're selling one, they're one of the best selling electric vehicles on the road. But they didn't get there by one or two failures. Right? As uh, Thomas Edison, the light bulb, you know, I have not failed, just found 10,000 ways that won't work. Right? Every failure is your opportunity to learn, which is what the labs and spaces of uh, experimentation is all about. Try, fail, try, fail, add something different, try, fail, try, fail, success. But those are all great ideas, but how do you let your brain decompress to a point that you can do that? And for me, I have to have some kind of escape. I have to get away from the daily grind of the work. You know, it's great, I got two boys, love them, but they're a lot of work. They do lots of sports. They go to school, after school, there's a, some activity. On the weekend, there's some activity. At work, I'm working a lot, I'm uh, context switching moving between a corporate acquisition and a problem in a building. So it's gone nonstop, nonstop. So how does the brain take a second to do that? Well, one way is to take an escape. And the way you can take an easy escape is just to build in what's called white space time. How many people know about white space? So basically white space, you look at your day and say, 
uh, from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m., I'm going to go into a room with a pad of paper and just write stuff down. Let your brain unwind ideas. Right? Are they all going to be good ideas? You think they're all going to be good ideas? They're not going to be good ideas. But maybe one of them will be the idea that leads you to the next idea the next day. So I encourage you to once a week, one time on the weekend, if you're studying for school, if you're working in a job and trying to go to school, carve out a little bit of time each day for white space time. Some people call it meditation, right? Others call it white space. I call it white space because there's a white space on my calendar. Nobody can touch it. Now to do that, you have to protect it. So if your white space time is at 1 p.m. and your friend calls up and says, hey, got this really fun thing, you want to go do it? Well, if you can keep that white space time another day, great. But if you start replacing that white space time all that happens is your brain fills up, and then you're waking up at 2 o'clock in the morning like with a great idea, but it's just not all baked. So let yourself have time to explore, to decompress. Other people have white space time by maybe going on a bike ride. Some maybe. consciousness, yes. The what? Subconsciousness. Yep, subconscious. The, you know, going for a hike, a run. There's lots of ways to do it. But Hold that time for yourself. It's important. There's other things that I'm going to suggest you do as well. But this is one of the major ones that I found that works for a fair amount of people. Reading books. How do you find out about new ideas and new technologies? Read. You say, read? That takes some time. So one thing that's interesting, and there's a bunch of studies out, the average CEO of a tech company read six books a month. Satya Nadella, Microsoft, right? Read six books a month. How many books have you read this month? 20. 20, yeah, that's a lot. Anybody read more than 10? How many people have read five books? There's one for 10. Five books? Okay, so. I must be, I mean, CEO. It's CEO, yeah. it's hard. But if they have enough time to do it. No, I must be. Oh, you must be a CEO? <laughs> or a seating pastor? Yes. Only the president of Donald Trump. Donald Trump. I mean, in There's a lot of ideas. Like, so there's lots of ways to do it. So take some time. It's hard. These are all hard because I know for myself, there's always something on my to-do list. Right? There's always something I have to get done. I have to pay the bills. I have to go to my kids' sports thing. I have to go to work. Right? But reading books is one way to expose your brain to new ideas. And it's been proven, like I said. Um, Steve Ballmer used to do it. Bill Gates has done it. Satya Nadella does it. Um, Elon Musk does it. Uh, you know, Amazon, we do it. So it, it is valuable. But don't read the same book. Pick up a different thing, right? Try something you don't even know anything about. It's how you get educated, right? And once you read that and you have that white space time, write it down. Keep a, keep a notebook. Just <laughs> drop an idea, drop an idea, drop an idea. So if you look at, you know, Leonardo da Vinci, which is this Kodak is from, I wrote a lot, right? Today we're on a computer. But that's not always the best way to get it from your brain and out. Now, some people, that's, the best, that's what they really can do. They can take great notes on a computer. But for me, I actually have to write it out. But find the thing that works for you to make some record of it. Because again, as you go and innovate new ideas, probably, and I'll, I'd almost bet that if you've written down all these notes as you're innovating new ideas and having your white space time, doing some reading and took a couple notes, at some point when you're coming up with that product or that next great idea or that next new process, you're going to go back and look at your notes. Because you're going to be like, I think I knew something. I, I made a note on this somewhere. But if you don't record that, if you don't have a way of expressing that into some other format, and it's probably not Facebook, you don't want to share it to everybody, most of it's just garbage anyways, 
But take the ideas that resonate with you and get them written down and then keep that. It actually works out fairly well. If you look at Jeff Bezos, you look at, uh, you know, if you go to a couple of the different uh, search engine companies, they do, they, they're prolific, prolifically writing things down. They write down a lot. Even in Amazon, we don't use PowerPoint as a presentation mechanism very much. We use, we write out. I have to write a paper. If I have a new idea, I actually have to write a six page paper on that idea, right? Can't be more than six. No idea at Amazon's more than six pages. So you have to be very succinct about what you write down and very, you know, get to the point. But it gets everybody on the same page very quickly. So as you learn to write stuff down, you come up with new ideas, which, and, and if you want inspiration, Leonardo da Vinci, he had a lot of prolific writing, came up with a lot of great ideas, stuff that we even use today because he was writing it down. The other one is look out and see where there's combinations and patterns. What are people doing? Look at your friends. One of the slides I'm going to show you is who do you hang out with? Do you hang out with the same people every day? Probably. We like to hang out with our friends. But I challenge you to hang out with somebody you don't normally hang out with. Right? Try different questions on them. What are they working on? What are they thinking about? Because you might find a pattern that leads to an idea, that leads to an innovation, that leads to something that you're passionate about doing it. About doing. Now, passion isn't all about making money, though for some of us, right, we want to make money. Sometimes passion is just the ability to solve problems for people. It doesn't have to be the biggest thing in the world. Some of the best ideas are local. Right? You're taking care of them in your local community. You're fixing things here, or you're fixing things in the, at a national scale. Getting to be a Google, an Amazon, a Facebook, a, you know, T-Mobile, that's hard. That takes time. Right? The, going back to this Ring idea, Ring.com, this digital doorbell. Jamie, who's the CEO, worked on it for years. He was, used his own money, but he had an idea that he wanted to solve a problem to. Amazon bought this company for $1.2 billion. Right. So, and he's so passionate about it, he still is running ring. Right. So he didn't just take the money and go. He took this passion about getting community built around you know, visibility to what's happening in your area and having a direct access to that as a very cool idea. So it doesn't have to be just about money. Money's good, it helps us get to other things, but it's not the be, be all of everything. So as you find these combinations, try it. Go to um, in, in events like this where they might not be the people you would normally hang out with. Right? It's hard sometimes if you are shy or you know, don't like talking to people. You don't like talking in public. I like talking in public. I like doing these things. I get energy from it. But exposing myself to different things allows me to see different patterns that are happening. And especially if you want to find a niche or an area where your idea might come together. You know, the, the ideas that are best don't always come out in the same group of people that you're hanging out with. Because what your friends are going to tell you is, that's a dumb idea. You can't do that. That's stupid, right? You might have some friends who are pretty supportive, but a lot of times your friends are like, not always the best to come up with the best ideas for you. Right? So challenge that. Find that. This goes back to who, who do you surround yourself with? So if you talk to the, you know, some of the leading people around idea and technology innovation, their challenge is once a week to surround yourself with people who are different than you. Right? Go to those events, just like I was talking a minute ago. But you have to actually make that a conscious thing to do. Because right? if you don't, you're going to hang out with your friends. Instead of uh, going to that 8 a.m. breakfast or coffee with some maker group that's doing something different than you're doing, you're going to naturally go in the direction that you're used to doing. So surround yourself. And that, that's a, it could be just at a friend's party. If you always talk to the same person, take a step over to and sit, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Rick. What do you do? They might be a marketer. They might be a writer. They might be somebody who volunteers their time in Africa. But you know what you're going to get? is a different viewpoint, a different way of thinking than the one that's in your head. 
And again, that leads to great ideas. You know, when Facebook wasn't created, he wasn't solving it for himself. He was solving a problem that all of his friends had complained about. That idea of a social, a place to post and be social and, and connect information, right? It was never thought of being the big social network that it is today. It was small, but it was something that was a problem. But he got exposed to other people around him. Okay? So remember, challenge yourself to surround yourself with different people. Not every day, but enough to, to try some different ideas. And then if you try your idea and you have an idea that you want to express, share it. You don't have to give them the whole thing. Like, hey, hey, I was thinking about doing this thing in Africa. What do you think? Honestly, what do you think? To do that, though, one thing you have to be willing to do is step back from their opinion. Right? And what I mean by that is they might not think it's a great idea. Right? Is that OK? Yeah. Yeah, it's OK. But you personally have to be able to take a little bit of criticism. Because if you're going to come up with a really great idea, there's going to be a lot of people who don't think it's a great idea. There's other people who think it's a bad idea only so they can take that idea and do their own thing with it. right? So criticism, constructive criticism, is a way of failing on that idea, maybe, and learning and applying it in a different way. You can say, oh, you don't like that idea. Well, why not? What would you change? And then you now turn someone who doesn't have the same opinion as you into a learning event, right? A way of understanding more. Because unless there's 10 million of me out there, I probably, if I'm going to make a product or an application or a solution, I probably need to satisfy you, 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 you. Know. If I want to have a great solution, I've got to satisfy the whole room. So it can't just be my idea. All of this idea, the stuff that I'm putting out in this presentation, is so you expand that idea to collectively be accepted. Now, is there an exception to everything? Sure. I might only want to target the three of you. And that's OK. But I'm looking for a mass market application that everybody wants to buy. I have to be able to go out and talk to any of you, get your feedback, and figure out how I incorporate that into my ideas. Then take that in white space. And, okay, what other ideas? Take that with meeting new people and asking you questions. Take that by stepping back and saying, hey, beat this idea up. It's okay. Give me some real constructive criticism about it. That's what being around other people will do. Creating ideas in a vacuum doesn't work so well. There's a lot of products that go to market that don't go anywhere, right? Probably because marketed bad, maybe it was just a bad idea, they didn't ask anybody about it, they didn't collect any information, and they couldn't let themselves step back from their idea to hear other people and what they need. Right? One thing about customer service and the ability to have a product that people like is that during that engagement of the product with that customer, the customer feels good about it. Right? You want your customers to feel good about whether you do marketing, whether you're building a building, whether you're selling them an application, a service, a widget. So getting feedback allows you to provide a product that's better fit for the consumer that you're going to. Right? So curiosity, again, I talked a little about these leadership principles at Amazon. Coming back to those, think big is one of them. One of the things we get hired on is our ability to think bigger than the one thing we're tasked to do. We're also graded, in some sense, on our ability to be curious and learn. I ask a lot of questions, lots of questions. Sometimes I even take the opposite, I mean, I might agree with you, but I'll take the opposite opinion just to have a conversation with you. Now, I'm divorced now. My wife did not like that idea. She thought I was treating her like an employee. One of many other things, but the idea that I would ask two deep a question, I'm like, hey, I'm just trying to learn. I'm like, why do you have that opinion? Like, why do you think that way? It isn't so much that I care that you have a different opinion than me, but I'm curious enough to ask and learn from you. And as I learn from you, 
Can I can change my behavior? That's one way I could go. I could say, yeah, well, I don't really care. That's another way I could go. Or I can incorporate that to be something better and bigger than it was. And so a lot of the time that I have at, at my job today around acquisitions, the why did we acquire that company? Right? What are we going to do with that company once we get them into Amazon? Why do they need to run their business a certain way? Maybe there's a reason they don't want to integrate their mail system into Amazon's mail system. And you know the only way I can find that out? Being curious. You know, science, the scientific method is about being curious. Right? Well, I took water and a fire, and the fire went out. You can stop there. Or you can figure out why that happened. And if I had gasoline and put it on the fire, why that one blew up, right? The scientific method, the idea of innovation, the idea to develop new ideas comes from your ability to be curious. What's over, overly curious? I don't know. Asking the wrong questions? Are there any wrong questions, really? No, there are always opportunities to learn something new. Right? I used. The, the, the rover on Mars, right? Its only job was to be curious. Right? <laughs> 10 years of development effort, like two years to get it there. It stayed alive a lot longer than they ever anticipated. And its only job is to be curious. But we've learned so much about its ability to be curious. Right? We know far more about Mars than we ever did. Just because scientists and the people who sent it there wanted it to think about. We took our questions and used that as an avenue of collecting information back. Now, as you are a maker lab or an innovation lab, part of that fits back to everything that I've talked about. Asking questions, exposing yourself to different opinions, taking feedback that you might like or you might not like. But it all allows you to think about the next idea, whatever it is. Right? It doesn't have to be technology. I just have to be a technology person. Right? But I like scuba diving. I like laying on a beach. There's probably better ways to lay on a beach, because I hate getting hot. But I like to sit in the sun and seeing the beach and swimming. Is there a way I can do that without feeling the heat from the sun? Sure, I can find an idea for that. It probably exists. People who work in the sun every day I already know. White. You know, white clothing, white linens. There's lots of ideas, but if you don't know them, you have to be curious to ask about them. So, what are some of the trends that you can use these skills on? Right, lots of technology. I'm only gonna cover a couple of them because there's, well, there's technology about everything. There's ideas about everything, so we can't cover it all. But for me, one of the big things that's coming out, been talked about for years, is the Internet of Things. Okay? I don't know why some of these things exist, but I can go to a store and I can buy a refrigerator and it has a TV on it. I don't know why. I haven't, I've been, I haven't been so curious as to ask because I don't really see the point of having a TV on a refrigerator, but they have that, right? But that's connected to the, to the system and they can order stuff for me. Um, there was a distinguished engineer at Microsoft, a guy named James Whitaker. And if you ever want to see great videos, look up James Whitaker on YouTube. He is an excellent speaker. He has a whole bit about the Internet of Things. He actively has, you know what a hot tub is, a sauna, jacuzzi? He's made his into the Internet of Things, so now it orders its own chemicals off Amazon. It uh, buys different things when it needs it. It records the temperature, but it's another device on the Internet of Things. Why? Because he could, right? Not any real reason to. He might decide to make a business out of that later, but the interconnectedness of the Internet of Things is an area of massive growth. Little sensors everywhere that let us know when a door is open. The, you know, my, uh, my ring camera, internet connected device, sends me a picture anywhere I'm at, another device. All sorts of ideas that are this interconnected web of things that we have. Now it's the uh, internet of everything. Internet of everything. Internet, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Internet, everything. Data around that is huge. If there's not an idea on this slide that you think you could capitalize on, then, then you're not really thinking about all the things we just talked about. Four billion connected, four trillion dollars, 25 million apps, 25 billion devices 
and 50 trillion gigabytes of data. Right? That's a Gartner, or I think it was Gartner, or one of the oh, uh, IEC. Right? That's, that's a lot. Right? And do we need all that data? Eh, probably not. But it's kind of cool. It's a big number. Lots of areas to innovate and come up with new ideas. Because how do you manage this? Like, that's, that's an enormous amount of data. Go to any enterprise like Microsoft, Google, Facebook, Amazon. We have so much data that we store that we don't look at. We can store it. It doesn't mean we should store it. But how do you do something with that? How do we monetize that data? Facebook is doing a good job of it. If you use Facebook, they've monetized your data. What do you look at? Oh, they look, they're looking for a new car. Oh, we're going to sell their data to, the, to Ford or you know, whoever because they want to buy a new car. Right? So they're taking that data that you're giving them through your device, through their application, and they're making money off of it. Right? So if money is an avenue or data is your avenue, lots of opportunity there. And that could be anything. That could be big data. That could be the AI of data, advanced intelligence. How do you, how do you get automation around all that? No one can look at that data. I had systems at, at Microsoft where the, they were full, petabytes of data. And I went to Windows, the Windows organization, and said, hey, I'm going to have to buy more storage, but I'd rather just work with you to get rid of the data that you don't use. And their answer was, go buy more storage. It's cheaper. It's cheaper for them to build another two petabytes of storage than it is to take five software engineers and go figure out what they actually are storing, right? It's crazy. This number, this number is just going to keep getting bigger because it's cheaper to store it than it is to analyze it unless you have big data and artificial intelligence. So there's, there's businesses just that are going to come up solely to do that, to look at data that we don't even need. We don't even know why we're collecting it. Cybersecurity. Everyone's heard of recent hacks on the network, uh, lost credit cards. Most major companies are exposed to it, right? That Facebook's lost your email, uh, your grocery store app has lost your credit card, right? Uh, huge area in cybersecurity. That's I'm taking my degree right now, uh, just to add into my you know understanding of the business because cybersecurity is really just a set of rings, right? Layers of defense about trying to protect information. And information that's super valuable. As I said, Amazon's a trust company. If you don't trust us to have your credit card and know your home address and get product to you, you won't buy from us. We won't buy from Alibaba or anybody else who has that same thing. Right? So we have layer upon layer of devices and technologies and processes that are protecting us that are based in the cybersecurity model. Do you know that most security problems, though, all of your guys' fault? Right? You open the email, you clicked on the link, and you open something you shouldn't have on your laptop, or your computer, or your phone, or that email looked real, phishing, and you put in data that wasn't good, and you put in your good data to someone who shouldn't have it, right? So while you hear about all these issues around companies getting hacked, they actually start right here. 67% of security problems start at the user level, right? Because we're inherently lazy, right? And the people who are trying to get your information are getting really good at it. They're, they're innovating. They're trying. Firewall prevents it. So what do they do? Try again. They're the perfect example of, inter uh, of fail, you know, try, fail, try, and be curious. That's social engineering is the ability to be curious. Hey, how's it going? Hey, you work at uh, Deloitte & Touche? Really, I, I, I talked to your IT director. What was his name? Oh, you give me his name. Great. Now I'm going to call. I'm going to say, hey, I need to talk to so-and-so. I'm down in the server room, and you know, the director's not available. What's his name? Yeah. So you can just see how people can navigate their way through a company just by curious, being asked questions, uh, and utilizing that information. So how do we stop them?
That's going to be a big area of innovation and ideas. And how many jobs are going to be created? Uh, they say by 2025, there's going to be 3.5 million positions unfilled in cybersecurity, in security related fields. Right. Huge. So, a lot of opportunity in that space. Now, there's all sorts of levels of this. This is, you can be a software engineer, you can be a marketer, right? Because there's a lot of devices that come through these systems that people are going to have to be able to understand, learn, and buy. Right? The thing that I like about cybersecurity, I like the forensics side. When, it, when there was an attack or an issue, how do, they, how do they walk it back all the way to where it started? There's people who can do that. There's a whole group at Microsoft called the Cybersecurity Defense Team. And that's all they do. They work with the federal governments you know, all around the globe that when there's a big hack, they start to break it down, figure out where it started from. Then, what they've done pretty effectively is they're almost getting down to who started it, right? Because people who hack at that level generally like to tell people about it too. Right? There's a little bit of pride in hacking into a big company. So lots of opportunity. Millions of jobs that are gonna open up in cybersecurity. Millions of products are going to need to be created. You know, we'll add on to those apps. Next big area, everything on demand. It's already here. Right? I want my package today. I want my food now. I want my car. Uh, you guys use a couple different systems here, but I'll use Uber. You know, I want my car now. I want my TV show now. Right? This is an area where the ability to make it work. Now, there's a lot of applications that are in the line of everything on demand. A lot of them don't work so well. Because right? inherently, people get in the way of that. Traffic gets in the way of that. But this idea that everything on demand is coming, is already here, and there's a lot of opportunity there in terms of innovation and growth. There's one, I don't know if you guys have heard of Prime Now. It's an Amazon product. But I can order something and have it delivered to my house in less than two hours. Does anybody really need it that fast? No, but it's sure fun. Right? When my son wants to buy that new game, and he says in the morning he wants it by the time he gets home from school and he's willing to pay for it, great. Amazon, you know, Prime Now, is it on the list? Yep. And I can track it. I see it when it leaves the warehouse. I see the car driving along on the map. I know exactly when it's gonna to get to my house, right? So it's here, there's more coming. You know, who, where's it going? You guys are all gonna dictate a lot of that, right? You're gonna come up with the next great idea, innovation, opportunity to put, it, to put it to work. The one that I think is the best new area to get into, and I didn't cover it on my people slide, but my dad worked for NASA back during the manned space missions to the moon. Right, so I got to meet Neil Armstrong. I was young, I wasn't very old. Not that old. Um, so I met Neil Armstrong. I met a bunch of the astronauts. I remember watching the Saturn rockets taking off. I remember the first landing on the moon. So cool. Like, I, I would mortgage my house to go into space. And there's people who are gonna help get me there, right? SpaceX, uh, everybody knows SpaceX, you guys know SpaceX? So their ability to launch a rocket and then land the first stage of that rocket back on the ground is pretty cool. Like, they have failed a lot. You can go to YouTube and watch video or video of the rocket going off the launch pad, boof, blowing up. But did they stop? Nope. They were curious to find out why that happened. And they innovated again and again and again. And they launched a rocket just uh, I don't know, six months ago where it had two of those boosters on the side. He launched a Tesla car into space. And then those two boosters landed right next to each other on the ground so they could be used again. How cool is that? That is commercializing space. That's going to hopefully make it cheap enough that I can mortgage my house and actually go into space. But if we let the governments do it, it's never going to happen. It comes from innovation in this room. I watched a video on uh, how, to, how we're going to get to Mars, right? And the people who were working for SpaceX were not my age. Nope. 
They're all your age. Young, entrepreneurial, great ideas, innovative, coming up with the next cool thing, willing to fail and try again and fail and try again until they could land one of those. They actually land them out on a floating pad. So the, the, you know, it's out in the ocean, it's doing this, and that rocket can still come down, correct itself, and land. Wicked cool. But those are ideas that come out of, out of like the idea to innovate, the idea to try something new, to really explore. Right? Oh, there it is. I forgot to add that. Right? Two rockets at the same time just launched the car into space, and they landed on the ground together. In sync, even. That's cool. So, last note, we'll kind of do a little quick Q&A, is as you think of the poem by Robert Frost called The Road Not Taken. Take 30 seconds and give it a read. I read it? Sure. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both. And be the one traveler, long I stood and look down as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other, as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as for that, the passing there had warned them really about the same, and both that morning equally lay, and leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubt if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. So for me, this poem tells about my story, right? I didn't go to college when I got out of high school. No, nope. I went to commercial diving school, learned how to be an underwater welder, but I was able to find a path to technology, doing things that a lot of people didn't do. I was in the Army and went diving. And then as I approach the things that I do around the work that I do, I can always take the standard way of doing it. Right? But I've been successful in my career because I've challenged the norm. I've done something different. I've tried something new. And I've innovated. Right. That whole last statement, right? I took the one less traveled by. So I encourage you, as you go through school, you finish university, you come into the major lab, you move on to the company, you find your career. That career could be two years, four years, or something longer, <coughs> right? Challenge the norm, if you can. Find the ideas that excite you. And then innovate, try again. Keep being excited. And the most, most important <clears throat> thing. What are the threats and opportunities the company will face in 10 years? A in company, or Amazon? Or Amazon specifically. Okay. What are the threats that Amazon will face in the next 10 in years? Opportunities. Uh, in opportunities. In opportunities. The opportunities for Amazon are to keep growing outside of the normal markets. Right? I know that in uh, large parts of Europe, uh, Asia, Africa, we have not penetrated that. We have stiff competition from Alibaba. We have to figure out how to differentiate ourselves in that model. And I think the other thing we have to figure out is we have, we're really two companies. We are AWS, our web services cloud division, and then it's Amazon, Amazon the website. Can we maintain two identities in the same company? Or will we need to eventually figure out a way to, to separate that? And if we separate, then how do you figure out valuations and all the other things? Threats? Uh, could be the same thing. The opportunities and threats are the, the backside of that. The threat is that there's more competition, right? The threat is your, your uh, desire to have more of this. We can't achieve faster than, I mean, two hours is great. Right, but two hours is only in specific markets. So what, is it gonna be drones? Is it gonna be you know, local delivery? How are we going to get the mass outside of large commercial centers? And then other threats, I think, uh, are, are totally a people problem. 
I cannot hire enough good people, right? I'm under stiff competition from every startup who has a cool idea. I'm under tons of pressure because where Amazon's headquarters is located is the same place that you know Google has an extensive set of offices. They literally built two Google offices right across the street from the Amazon campus, right? With kind of a, you know, like, so we're having a battle of that. Um, I have Microsoft campus right at probably you know, 15 miles away. So getting the right talent is huge. It's going to be a problem. That does, that's not just technology talent. That's, that's across the board, right? So, and if you think about all the game studios, like here, here's your option. You're a great software engineer or a great marketer. You can come and market some books on Kindle, or you can market the next global multiplayer game. Which one do you like there? I can tell you, this is a personal experience. I worked in Xbox. I go on lots of trips because we we're launching games globally. And I'd sit on planes and we go, hey, what do you do? Oh, I, I work at, at Microsoft. I, I work at Xbox. Oh man, I play Halo and it's just a great game. I <laughs> do this and I was on the weekend. Okay, great. And then I switch into IT. Sitting next to the same person on the plane. Hey, what do you do? I work in IT. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> right? So when you think about the competition for resources, they're kind of doing the same thing. If you have the opportunity to work on the next huge cloud service or come write automation scripts in IT, where are you probably going to go? Now, some people might really like writing scripts and automating 15-year-old processes about how to get rid of their 50 terabytes of data, or how do I make the next cool thing? Right? So competition for resources is probably the biggest, biggest thing. Thank you very much. Really interesting presentation. Uh, my question is, at Amazon, like big uh, companies, how do you hire people? What do you look for? And what differentiates a uh, successful candidate from an ordinary So what are you looking for? Um, who do you want to teammate? Great question. Great question. So, Question was, how do we find the right people? How do they get started? How can I interview for the right thing? So, uh, since great fits in there, the stuff that I'm, I'm actually here teaching next week on is leadership and soft skills, right? Your ability, I can teach probably anybody in this room any technology, right? Technology's not unique, it's just the next thing. How many people here know how to drive a car? <coughs> Some of you. Okay, how many people know how to cook dinner? Cook something? How many people can walk a dog? Anybody can, right? Technology is just a set of learning. No developer knew how to write code until they learned how to do it. Nobody learned how to drive a car until they learned how to do it. So I can teach anyone technology. What I can't teach are soft skills, right? Your ability to, to do a lot of the stuff that we talked about in here. Be curious. Some people just aren't curious. They're good with just the way it is. They probably are not going to make a good Amazon or Microsoft or Google employee, right? What we hire against at uh, Amazon are called the, the, the leadership principles. The ability to be curious, think big, hire great people, have a backbone, disagree, right? You actually want people to disagree. Now, when you leave the meeting, you fall back in line with whatever the decision is. But it's the leadership principle is to come in there and be able to openly say, I don't like your idea and here's why. <laughs> And then, listen, right? Because then you learn to be curious. So those are the skills that I'm looking for. Those are the skills that I teach a lot on, which is the soft skills. Be curious, ask questions. Sometimes people just don't communicate well. And that's tough. I know some people have a really hard time in interviews. And it's unfortunate because when I'm thinking about that interview, and I do interviews, um, it's, in, in Amazon, it's, uh, there's a bar raiser interview or an as appropriate interview at Microsoft. And basically what that person's job is, is are you a good candidate, not just for the job that we're interviewing you for, but are you a good candidate for the company? So if my, my division gets shut down tomorrow, can you go into another group and work? So that's why those skills are important. Your ability to listen, ask questions, be curious. Um, when I ask you if you, how do you like to learn? Uh, yeah, I, I watch a lot of TV, you know. <laughs> Probably a better answer is, hey, I go to events. 
like, and I talk to other people about technology, or I talk to other people about marketing. I find a marketing conference. I like to read uh, periodicals put out on marketing. I read some sites on the internet. Oh yeah, what blogs do you read? Staying active in the community is another thing that we're looking for. But most of all, I'm looking for someone who wants to be there. Right? That idea that they're going to come and have fun. I have fun every day at my job. Do I always like the day? No. But I'm having fun in the bigger scheme of what I'm doing. My, when I took over this group, my boss, he said, I don't want you to be an engineer. I can be an engineer. I don't want you to be a PM or a program manager or project manager. I want you to be a leader. I want you to bring this team together so they have an identity, so they're engaged, so they know what they're doing, and they can have, you know, he didn't say have fun, I did. But again, getting people to come together. That's where I have passion and that's where I find energy in my day. And so in that interview, I'm trying to figure out what their passion is. And I ask people a question, and it's an interesting one because it throws you off. You're all like there ready to talk about your marketing skills, your, you know, your leadership skills. But I ask you a question. If you could make a website about anything, what would it be about? People go, uh, I'm like, anything. There's no budget. Then you start, then you start to tease out an answer that's actually the person. Because you'll find out they like to be a photographer, they, they're in the, to donation, donating their time, or they really like to cook. I want somebody who's well-rounded, somebody who thinks something other than a job. Because if all you think about your job is someday you're going to experience burnout. Once again, Rick, thank you very much for this presentation. It was very interesting. But I was really curious about that uh, slide you showed us, how companies are gathering the data and keeping the data of the customers, right? So, uh, as you, uh, yeah, uh, that was great somewhere, anyway. So, that uh, one? yes, this one. So, but as you know, the recent cases uh, with the Facebook, right, when the government, sort of, uh, when the government decided that, well, actually, this is a big threat to the national security sometimes. Uh -huh. And it show actually that now the national states, and you know there were some uh, additional rules were taken in the European Union, of the, of the, of the, of the, not intellectual property, but about personal data. But it shows that actually the national states, they start to think about that more closely, like, okay, we, we probably should not allow the, like, internet com the big companies to gather all the data. And now I, I actually can see, and a lot of people are seeing, that there could be a big conflict between the states, the national states, and the national securities, and the companies. Because Companies, they want to incorporate as much customers and that information as possible for the business. Correct. But the state saying that, okay, probably we should not do that because it's a problem of the national security. So what do you think about the company? Who will be probably, or maybe it's not a big company? So the question was, what do I think about the, the maybe potential conflict between companies like Facebook clicking on consumer data and then utilizing it on a bigger scale where now it becomes a uh, nation state problem. And in the case of the American election, where Facebook was selling data that was then utilized by potentially uh, Russian systems to influence the election, ideas like that. At what point does it become a consumer problem and turn into more of a national threat problem? And so that's a tough one because companies like Facebook are collecting the data to sell it. They, you know, Facebook is inherently free, so their their way to monetize is by figuring out how to sell your data to advertisers or to someone who sees a need for how to use it. But I do believe, this is my own personal opinion, it's not an Amazon opinion, it's not a Microsoft opinion, it's my opinion, that at some point, things like GDPR, which is the um, Personal Data Protection Act within the European Union, things like that are going to restrict access for companies on how much personal data they can collect. And at some point in the United States, we're going to put restrictions, and we're already putting restrictions on what can be sold. Now, what that's going to do is it's going to change the dynamic of how companies monetize information. But I believe it's going to have to get it. your data is you know clearly it's utilized for stuff that you didn't necessarily give permission for. And so the question is going to be at what point is your data, or that you gave up your rights to that data? And I think that's going to have to be you know a much higher you know bar to hold whether it's the United States Supreme Court or it's the European Union's privacy or US Congress. But there's lots of um, um, legislation all over the globe, including China and Asia, where they're saying your data is your data. Like going so far that even your email address, you have to give permission to even let somebody have. 
So I think that's the direction that I'm supportive of that direction. Thanks. So it means that you, anybody who's writing software applications wants to monetize it, you're monetized on the extra things. Like um, that, the, this, Prime Now is a service over and above your Amazon membership. You can be an Amazon member for free, but if you want Prime membership, you have to be in the Prime group. So there's gonna have, you're gonna have to be able to put in differentiated content that you can monetize. Because no one's gonna pay for Facebook, the application. They're gonna pay for the, the thing that's gonna make it better. And that's where companies really have to start, when you think about your innovation on your application, is how do you differentiate some services to a point that people are gonna wanna pay you for those services? Because it's not gonna be data anymore, not your personal data. Excellent presentation, so just a few questions. The first one is, uh, what brings you to Kazakhstan? Are you on some sort of a world tour or something? And the second one is, um, are there any plans in short term or long term to launch uh, Amazon products in Kazakhstan? Uh, when I used to study abroad, I was a huge fan of Amazon Prime because I used it for free. As a, I mean, the quality of service was really great. Thanks. So questions are, what am I doing in Kazakhstan? Yeah. Uh, I'm actually here teaching a course uh, around leadership for uh, say university uh, graduates. Is there a pro program name you want to? Transformation Leadership Program. Transformation Leadership Program, TLP. Uh, basically that group is a whittled down the university graduates to a small group that um, through a series of trainings over the next couple of months, we get them positioned to be able to do in uh, internships over in the US. So I kick off the program with uh, basically a lot of stuff on leadership, soft skills, lots of stuff on the soft skills. So that's it. And then the second question was, is there a, and I'm not on a world tour, I'm only halfway around the world, so. Um, <laughs> that's, that's, that's a question. <laughs> the, uh, the Amazon one is, at, right now, to the best of my knowledge, there's no movement to light up Amazon services here. Yeah. Is program open to everyone? Is the program, uh, the TLP program open to everyone? Do you want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, so yes. we're open for people that um, basically are last year at the university up to age 27. Um, we can send us some more information through uh, our hosts today on that if you'd like uh, and go from there. Yeah, great. So in that course, I give a lot of challenging things like how you're going to work on a team because in the U.S. we work effectively on teams. So day one, I put you in teams and start have to worry about. Remember, I say sometimes you just have to step back and listen to other people's ideas. You can disagree but commit. Those are practices that we learn in the TLP program as a way of getting you ready because when you go to the U.S. Uh, or a lot of big companies, a lot of big enterprises use that teaming method. And if you're a type A personality and it's only your way, you're not going to get very far. So. Uh, yeah, can I say? Yeah, so the question is about the blockchain system. So it's the easiest way to control the, the whole supply and chain. So do you actually plan to invent it in your system or you already have something or you're not funny? So there is work happening in blockchain as a form of identity and optimization around transactions. Uh, I'm not in that group. I don't know enough about it. I actually had a slide about blockchain and I pulled it uh, because I was not able to speak to it enough. But it is, it is definitely within our range of trying to, how do you have that trusted authentication and transaction? And that is a system to be able to do that with. The concerns that we have here are not necessarily around the transaction. It's the net underlying network system. And that's something that that hasn't solved for yet, which is the network injection and things like that on the, on the physical layer, not so much at the transactional level. And uh, about the, the logistics, I mean, uh, how it goes. Uh, I knew that Alibaba just started the launching and they're testing the program because in China it's very, very fast to, to grow up and they sometimes lost the things. Yep. So they tried to invent blockchain just to check, like, because they had to sign an assistant that they received and they go so they already know where the where it was lost and who is responsible for that. So yeah, so our ability to track our, our supply chain is very good. Yeah. Again, so it's not a supply chain problem. It's a physicality of if you order it now and you're in Western Kazakhstan, how do I get that to you, right? Say you're in a, one of the oil producing areas and it's a three hour flight and a five hour train ride to get there. How do I ensure that it, I can actually get it to you in the time frames that we sign up for? And is it physically, does the infrastructure physically support that? Then, so I have a physicality, how do I get it to you? Transactionally, I think we're okay because we do transactions all over the world. 
But then we have the fundamental physical layer network of the stack that we want to make sure is fundamentally safe from hacking and really, you know, where where does government come into play on that? And we're not so positive about where that is. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not, I can't speak for Amazon directly on that. I just know that we have countries that we just don't do business in. So again, that don't take that as a as a news quote that Rick says Amazon will never be here, please. That's not I'm not authorized to speak at that level. Um, I just know that it, in trying to do work, those are some of the things that have come up for some of our acquisitions. So I saw a hand over here. Uh, thank you for your presentation. And I wanted to continue the thing about the carrier in Amazon. More and more often, I see in news that big IT companies don't even require a university diploma, especially for coders. Is it true for Amazon? Uh, well, yes, because I do not, I do not have a, a degree. So, so I do not have a university degree. I'm getting my, my, my degree now through cybersecurity. Um, a lot of mine has been 25 years of experience. Now, when you say, do we hire at the college level or the university level without specifically having, a lot of it will come with what is your skills and capability. Right? We are a, a company that, and this is same with Microsoft, um, they're looking for your skills and your ability. Are you going to help the company? Are you going to be able to perform the job that you're there to do? And when you get interviewed, were you able to answer the questions that were presented to you? Now, does a college degree make you a better coder? Potentially, does it or make you a better marketer? Yes. So in all those cases, most of the time, the university will, will do that. But if you talk to, I would say probably half the people at Amazon and say, "Are you doing work in your degree field?" The answer is probably not. Right. But what we're looking for is knowledge of the space, your ability to, you know, for me again, is it so much your technical skills? Though so I will have people interview around your technical skills. It's whether or not you can actually be a, a value to Amazon or to Microsoft. Um, a lot of times we will list the college degree as a requirement. But what you're seeing more and more on technology jobs is a four years college degree or six years equivalent industry experience. And so we are looking for industry experience. Now, at the college level, if you were doing like what we consider to be called college hires, in most cases we are looking for a college degree because the likelihood of having six years or eight years of industry experience is small. But it doesn't preclude that. If you go in there for the right job and have enough information, you can get hired. I said, I'm an example of that. I do not have a college degree, I have a technical degree, uh, but I, was, I did have the experience. Uh, okay. When you create the uh, for example, project and look at deadlines, and the, sometimes the deadlines, uh, the project don't reach a deadline. And the, how often do you uh, face this problem and uh, how to solve it? The question is how often do we slip from that program slip? I'd say, I'd say about 40% of my projects have slip, right? Now, there's lots of ways you can measure a slip. Because you can re-baseline. So in, in the project, project management kind of speak, you have a baseline. This is what the project is. Here are the requirements. This is when we're going to put it out. Okay? Now, sometimes you slip past that date. So you can say, I slipped past that date. My project's yellow or red. Like, I have a big problem. I'm not going to make it. Or enough things changed in our delivery that we're re-baselining. So hey, it was going to be March 1st. But because these 10 things happen, it's going to be March 15th. We just re-baseline that and keep ourselves green. But we do see that quite a bit. Um, it depends on the scale of the project. But with Agile, are you familiar with Agile methodologies? So Agile methodology in the terms of development is the idea that you, instead of having an 18-month development cycle, try it, and for those of you who know this really well, if I get it wrong, just tell me. <laughs> um, you can have an 18-month development cycle, but with an agile cycle, you're doing a small work time with achievable results. Like, you're not gonna solve the, all, the whole problem, but you're gonna chunk it up into little bits where there's actually, at the end of those two weeks, there's some success, so you can roll it out. This continuous delivery, continuous improvement methodology. Um, so we do a lot of that. That way, if you are having a slip, you might just not release that feature, and you might release the next in the next sprint. 
So, but it is, I'd say 40% of most projects are, are getting that. What's, what's the key differences between Microsoft and Amazon culture-wise? Uh, culture-wise, differences between Microsoft and Amazon. Uh, Microsoft is way more established in processes. They've been around a while. They know soft, big software development. Uh, they have a integrated, what we call an integrated stack. So the network, the Active Directory, your identity, your email, your operating system, the server operating system, the enterprise software like Office, Excel, PowerPoint, they all work together because they were all built by the same company. At Amazon, we buy your product, we buy your product, we buy your product, and we're like, how do we make them fit? So it's a lot of Frankenstein. So we try to mash that all together. So that's one big difference. And so that adds complexity. The other thing is Amazon works very quickly. And so we have a lot of things called technical debt, more technical debt than at Microsoft. Technical debt is you go create a product because it solves your problem, then you either leave the company or move on to another group, and I'm left having to run your little application or program, but now I'm dependent on it, but it doesn't work the way it needs to, or if we introduce a patch or technology change, it stops working, but my entire system is dependent on that. So it's technical debt, I have to go in there and fix that, even though it's not a priority. So there's a lot of things like that. The other thing is, I was surprised, is if you look up the Amazon, the 14 Amazon leadership principles, we do these, you know, they prep you for this interview that you're gonna be speaking about the leadership principles, and you're like, yeah, okay, I get that. But then you get there, and they actually talk leadership principles in all the meetings. Hey, can you dive deep on that? Hey, I, you have to have a bias for action to get that done. Hey, can you, you know, be vocally self-critical about yourself? You know, we actually use that speak in the meetings, and I'm like, oh my God, they actually do what they say they're going to do. Uh, the other thing is that both companies, though, move a mile a minute. There's, every day there's something new going on. So that's why one of the reasons I really like it is because you can move anywhere in the company, and we we have everything from ring devices through to you know, airplanes to uh, you know drones. Just if you, if you can, there's a technology stack you like, or marketing, or HR, <laughs> advertising, sales. It's a big enterprise. You know, like I said, six hundred thousand people. typical day. Um, so I would say one, one of the things, so the question is what's kind of a typical day for me at Amazon? One of the things I do like about my job is I have my to-do list written on paper, um, but by about 10 o'clock in the morning, it's blown up because something's changed, some activity, or some, we've slipped some project, we have to re-baseline, um, so it's very active. But normally my day starts off with a fair amount of you know, meetings in the morning, really check in across for my various managers around the, since I have corporate integrations, how are we doing on the integrations that we have, and then checking in on a building review, because I've got about 40 buildings getting built right now uh, that need work, and just getting a pulse on those. So really in that case is, are there any roadblocks that are keeping my team from being successful? And if some other manager above me or my, direct, or my senior director wants some information, I'll be prepared. So there's a lot of just kind of checking in on my team and knocking down roadblocks. I spend a lot of time on email. Uh, email is our primary form of communication, so I'll get about 250 mails a day. Most of them don't need any action on my part, so you have to learn how to get rid of the ones that mean nothing to you. And then answer those, and a lot of them is redirecting. So since I'm in a leadership role versus a, like a doer, specifically a doer role, a lot of it is finding out who on my team is best suited to be able to do that work and then following up to make sure it happens. Uh, probably 15% of my day is true leadership. Rallying the team to do something, thinking about how I get the team together. Um, a lot of time right now, I probably spend 20% of my week right now recruiting, trying to find people. So I meet people for coffee, meet people for lunch, meet people after work for drinks, just to see if I can find the right talent who wants to work at Amazon, who I think would be a good fit, so I'm out. Doing that, and that's an expected part of the leader's role is to recruit for your team or recruit for Amazon. How big is your team? Uh, right now, it's 44 people on my team. So my biggest team I had at Microsoft, I had 165 full-time employees. 
I won't ever be that big an Amazon. I don't think the scale is there. Um, but it, so right now I have eight open positions. Uh, so I'll have you know 52 or whatever that makes once I get them filled. But a lot of time is spent recruiting or re-recruiting. Right? This team that I took over hadn't had a manager for a year. They were kind of all doing their own thing. So one program manager is building this building this way, and this program manager is building an, almost a duplicate building a different way. It's like, what? <laughs> so trying to get processes and procedures to come together, that's another part of my day that I do. All right, I think we're, I'll take one more question. I don't know how much time we have. Let's see one or two. Uh, can you actually uh, show us how you organize your notebook? Is there a way of any certain techniques to uh, manage? Sure. Yeah. So I can just tell you how I do it. So I have uh, two. There's two different ways that I manage my notebook. First off is I have a running to-do list. All right. That running to-do list I update twice a week. So just what do I need to do? It comes in from email. It might come in from a phone call. Um, <laughs> So I'm trying to be better about using my computer, so uh, I'm trying to, to throw some stuff up there. Um, but yeah, I'm just following up, so I'm just keeping a running list and checking it off. Now on paper, which is my preferred method because I haven't perfected this, I will still have that same running list, but I'll use highlighters, you know, a yellow highlighter. So a yellow highlight for me, important, gotta get that done. When it's done, hit it with a pink highlighter. That way I know it's been finished. Um, but twice a week, I take everything that's on not, I haven't done it here, but uh, twice a week I'll take it and update it onto a new page because it'll grow rather quickly. Uh, and a lot of it's just handoffs. Like, you know, you asked about like hiring. Okay, I've got, let's see, one, two, uh, three, four. So this is just my to do list for that day. And four of those items are around recruiting people or finishing off on hiring, things like that. So there's a lot of that. But most of it's just write it down, highlight it, close it off when I'm done. The things that I have to do though, the biggest thing with all the work that flows in is how to prioritize. There's some amount of work that you're just never gonna get to. Right? So if I were to open up, you know, last time I tried to use my computer was on the 20th of November. Um, I'd go in there, there's probably a lot of stuff I never even did. Because what happens is these priorities are shifting all the time. And there is something to be said for not doing it. And then if someone calls you back and says, oh, I really need it done, then you know that it's a priority for them too. There's a lot of work. Okay, we've got time for one more. I think you raised your hand. Uh, yeah. I recently heard about your, um, one of your products, Amazon Go. Amazon Go? Yeah. Um, and uh, could you tell us more about the product? What's the current state of it? And is it popular in America? It's cool. Hmm? So Amazon Go, is the ability to walk into a store, uh, to walk into a room like this, which is a, a grocery store or food store, you take your phone, swipe it, go grab everything you want, walk out the door. No cash register, nothing. So the infrastructure in that store is a bunch of sensors, eye trackers, um, RFID, uh, UFC, you know, a bunch of uh, different, different devices that track the products. Uh, it's super popular for the stores that we have open. We're expanding it. Uh, and it's so nice, I'll walk by the, the go store, grab lunch, just keep, keep on walking. Don't have to worry about a line. And the transaction, every transaction I've had has been correct. It's pretty cool, yeah. So it's a, it's a great um, taking a, a, a consumer need, which is, you know, go back to that, uh, that's off the, the, you know, everything on demand. I want my groceries and I don't want to wait in line. So the Go technology allows that to happen. I can walk in, it's all detected, and I just leave with the product. Why Amazon did, uh, like, thought that this is gonna work uh, in, like, when we have a lot of food order online stores, and why people go to the... Well, it's convenient. So if I'm walking between meetings, hypothetically, it's a great experience. I can walk from one meeting, pass the store, and go pick it up. If I'm gonna have to stop and order something, inherently, if you order something online, you have to navigate that person's application. Right? So that takes a little bit more time than I might have. So it's the ability to quickly get in and out. Also, if it's the need for, you know, how many times have you gone to the store and bought something you didn't really need? A lot. 
Or, hey, that, that looks good, I'll grab one of those, and I'll grab one of those. So it allows people to probably buy a little bit more than what they're just thinking in their head. But the main thing was convenience. The ability to use the, use the Amazon app, which has become ubiquitous, right? I can buy from the store, I can buy from .com, I can buy from now, I can order a Kindle book. Wow, we're getting you pretty well, aren't we? Now you can go to a grocery store and just buy your food with the same app. Right, or the same underlying system. And for us, the infrastructure that ties all that together is, can be the same. Right? So I don't have to develop new ideas and new technologies. So it allows us to innovate across a wider range of technologies and services to be able to get you to stay our customer. Thank you. All right, I'm going to wrap up. I, we're out of time, I think. And uh, appreciate all the questions, your attentiveness. I hope that you go out and learn something, and in the end, I hope you have fun with whatever you choose to do. Thank you very much.